We're back. It's another Thursday. We have Think and Link, and we have finally decided to cover the subject of AI. I have been wrestling with this uh, subject area for a while, which I'm sure all of you have as well. Um, I needed to find two people that had wrestled with it a lot longer and in a lot more messy ways than I have, and these two definitely have. Um, I also kind of, you know, the whole like, you know, something comes out and you see come, someone come out, I'm an expert in blah, right, the next day, and they don't follow the 20,000 hours rule, there's no way, they can't be an expert. Um, so I wanted to find some older and also slightly older. <laughs> More experienced. More experienced uh, people who could talk about this. And, uh, and also people that came from the last generation of AI, um, because it's been around. Um, that was that, that thing like Watson. I don't know, we should get an update on Watson. Is Watson still alive? Watson still living? The person or the technology? Uh, <laughs> so Lucinda Watson is alive. And that's who Lucy's named after. No shit. That's a branding thing. I feel do you, like do you I understand should know branding? That. I feel like I should know that. Yeah, so I think uh, and told she, me that. She, she's on LinkedIn and periodically comments on Lucy's progress. I usually do a tremendous amount of background on our speakers, but because of it's the fact that it's Dan, I didn't do any background <laughs> at all because I figured I had plenty. Um, so he's going to surprise me with some things, I'm sure. That's going to happen. Anyway, uh, first, a note to our sponsors. Uh, our first sponsor, our greatest sponsor ever, is actually here in the house, Ryan Rudd from, where is he? Raise your hand, dude, Lake One. So we've been, we've been calling him out because he hasn't been here, and he sponsors, and he's a good friend, and he employed my son for a while, and we love everything he does. We talk about him, and we're trying to do more business with him. And, uh, and then people started sending him messages via LinkedIn. Hey, dude, why aren't you at your event? I thought that was very funny. But now we can't do that anymore. It's not funny. Um, and then RSP Architects, who designed this space, uh, an amazing international firm. We get to, as Capsule, live in this space, um, which alludes to the fact that there's a third sponsor, which is Capsule. We are a special projects agency headquartered here in Minneapolis, working with brands like Arcteryx, um, Quick Trip, Patagonia, Hydro Flask, and a variety of others all over the country and in our own backyard. And uh, that's the sponsors part of this thing. Now, I'm going to hand it over to Kitty, who's going to introduce herself, my co-host. And then we're going to go to Paul and Dan. Thank you. Hello, everyone. If you don't know me, my name is Kitty Hart. I am with Heroic Productions. We're a corporate production company, event production company. I get the pleasure of coming and sitting at your side every once in a while, pretty frequently. Yeah. As your co-host, I spent 10 years at Capsule uh, and was with you when you we launched Think and Link. So it's been fun to see this evolve fun to have it here. Uh, I'm looking out into the room here and there are a lot of past speakers here as well. So there's Steven, I see Tim Brunel, I see many others. So welcome everyone. Um, super excited about this conversation with, with AI. And I, I wanna kick this off by saying there's no shortage of speaker events, panel discussions on the topic of AI. But when we had the prep call with these guys, <laughs> we got really excited because let me tell you what my pet peeve is, going to events where the topic is AI and one of the main take takeaways is, well, it'll be really interesting to see what happens with this, <laughs> right? How annoying is that? You're not gonna get that today. You're gonna hear some really amazing takeaways. So let's start with some introductions. Um, so, Paul, why don't we start with you? Tell us a little bit about your background and what you're doing. Thank you for having me here. Um, I have been a tech entrepreneur since 1990. And like Dan, we both grew up in full text search, massive databases, just information retrieval. Um, and I was fortunate to co-found Ancestry.com in 1996. So when you were early in the dot-com era, there were very few, there, everyone was an expert if you owned a domain name and launched a company and got any funding, uh, but we were, uh, had a blast turning Ancestry into a, a powerful um, 
data set of all the world's genealogical records, or I think they're up to 60 billion records now. I haven't owned any shares since 2006, so please don't complain to me about their DNA policies or <laughs> anything else. Uh, but uh, I've been uh, working on AI things for a few years now, and I'm currently running soar.com, which is an AI studio. We'll, we're launching 15 AI companies over the next two years. We've launched five already, 10 more coming, and I'm sure you'll hear about some of those during the conversation today. But um, while I'm, I'm not a AI expert data scientist going back decades, I'm an application uh, entrepreneur finding what's the biggest next technology wave that will sweep through the world and how can I participate in that wave? Did that with CD-ROM, did that with the World Wide Web, did that as a Facebook app developer, built an app that got 120 million users in two and a half years. So I'm a, a platform entrepreneur looking for the next platform. And I think this is the biggest, best, greatest platform I've ever seen in my life. And I don't expect to ever see it go away. It's, it's, it's here for good and it's gonna change everything. And you officially changed your middle initials to A and I, right? As I see that on your LinkedIn. My nickname, uh, for decades was Paul Allen, the lesser. <laughs> and it was, it was some friendly venture capitalists that said, what, which Paul Allen are you talking about? The Microsoft one or Paul Allen, the lesser. And, uh, I have a friend who's Whitney Johnson. She's one of the top leadership coaches and talent coaches in the United States. And she is on the board of directors of a Paul Allen led company in Dallas. And I'm the second Paul Allen on her smartphone. So she told me I'm Paul AI Allen. The other Paul Allen is just Paul Allen. So I quickly switched from Paul Allen, the lesser wow. to Paul AI Allen. It's better. It's much better. <laughs> Paul Allen, the living. <laughs> There's another option. Paul AI Allen. Yes. Uh, wonderful. Dan, please. Uh, so I'm Dan Mallon. Uh, for those here, a serial entrepreneur in the Twin Cities. Um, lots of cool uh, stories and uh, you know it's funny you mentioned domain names or domains and and really the history my history is in the nine in 1992 I registered malin.com which is how you can get a hold of me dan at malin.com and um, in the AI world dot uh, AI as a domain name is Antilia right in the Vir Virgin Islands or wherever that is um, and uh, I have an account in their Nick or Internick, where we registered Lucy, and today you can't get an account there. You have to buy it through somewhere else. So, uh, I, it's it's a funny thing, but the origin is that when I registered Balin.com, it was free. It, there was no charge to register a domain name, and the uh, Lucy.ai is registered in a place nobody can register them anymore either. So, if that's the history, then that's all I've got. Uh, serial entrepreneur, similarly, always just focused on, um, actually, Padilla wrote something years ago, which I, I really thought said it, which was, um, there's a new technology, people are trying to figure it out. Uh, Scott and Dan, Scott, my business partner, will find a way to make competitive advantage and bring it to lots of audiences. And that's what we've done and continue to do um, uh, uh, again throughout, throughout history here. Today, we have a product called Lucy, Lucy.ai, you should check it out. Really cool enterprise knowledge management. Lucy connects to all the data inside your company, reads, watches, and listens to it, and then is an answer engine um, and done at scale for big companies, um, Kraft and Pepsi and Walmart and, you know, the, and the like. So it's kind of, it's really cool. And if you think about in your company, just how many PowerPoints are created every day and what if Lucy had that information and then could just bring you the slide you were looking for. So that's kind of the, the, the cool tech. I do want to say something about AI. It was not invented last year. How many of you used AI to get here? <laughs> Google Maps, any navigation technology? We've been using it for 20 years productively. Um, and, and so it's really funny to those of us who, who that, that it was invented this week. Mm -hmm. I was an AI in and I just told the gentleman out there. Yeah, she, so the comment, the comment was, I was an AI in 1989. I'm sorry, Dave, I'm afraid I can't do that. Stanley Kubrick in the 60s. So it's been around.
Okay, so let's talk about that as the first question. What happened that all of a sudden it is front and center and is no longer going like this, but going like this? What happened? What unleashed the beast? I, I can jump in first, but we both. So there's a crazy thing called LLMs, GPT, chat GPT. Um, it's, I'm going to call it newer technology when in November of 22, when it first became publicly known, it was chat GPT 3.0. Just so you all get that in your heads. Even the one that we think is the origin story is version 3.0. And so, uh, so again, we've been, you know, Lucy had it built in a year earlier as a, as a, as a thought process. But what's cool about this thing is they decided to make a publicly available um, version that really was supposed to be a demonstration of the art of the possible. They never thought that what happened was going to happen. They never thought every consumer in the United States would try it. Uh, and so obviously the, the adoption curve went crazy um, and the concern curve went crazy and the scared curve went crazy and the I don't know curve went crazy, but that's my story of what happened. Yeah, humans have always wondered about language and when computers would be able to understand and create language. And so these LLMs that were based on some transformer technology from 2016 is changing everything. It's never gonna go back. What is fascinating to me is when GPT-3 came out, we started realizing that what we had been doing for two or three years, which was training machine learning models for sales and leadership. So if you think about it, sales experts they can detect patterns of the, the sales process, the steps in the sales process. You start by building rapport, then you start by asking questions, um, deep pain questions. And so sales training, sales is a very, very common profession. I think one out of 10 people in the world are in sales. And there are hundreds or thousands of sales training companies. And you could create a custom AI model that would watch a Zoom call or a phone call to see if the person that you've just trained on sales is following the steps, doing the technique correctly, or how closely they're following the methodology. And that was magical. And it was taking us $50,000 in three months to build a custom AI model that would uh, reflect what the sales trainer was trying to teach you to do. Because you had to go through thousands of transcriptions, thousands of emails, and identify when it was done properly and when it wasn't. And we would feed that into a GPT Neo. And for $50,000, we could help any sales training company have their own AI model. When GPT 3 came out, we thought, ooh, I wonder if models need to be built anymore. Maybe you can just ask it a question. And since it's trained on all the language from billions of pages, then maybe it will start to be as good as the whole the human training model. Well, when GPT 3.5 came out, our Google Cloud server went down for a day and we had to replicate, we replicated our model that took us $50,000 in three months in 15 minutes with the same accuracy level using prompt engineering. So the what? coolest thing about LLMs is that it replaces, it's a thousand times faster to build custom AI models or custom AI applications than it was two and a half years ago. Okay, which is why when the GPT store opened up, three million people launched a GPT on that day. Now, none of them were very important or impressive. So that was kind of a misfire, I think, on OpenAI's part. But when Facebook had launched in 2007, 65 companies launched a Facebook app that day. And many of those apps went on to get tens of millions or hundreds of millions of users. I thought it was going to be another Facebook platform launch moment. And I think my team laughed at me because we were we we launched ten or twenty GPTs that day. Me too. Uh, so along with, I think we account for half of them. <laughs> and, the, and there were three million, and and it just anyway it was. But but it is so much faster and easier now to take any concept, any idea, anything you want to analyze and give feedback on. You can now do it with a prompt or with some fine tuning. It's just insanely cool and fast how you can deploy custom applications now. Okay, so, and I've been telling people this, I go 
my emotional spectrum of fear to excitement. So I just went to excitement for a little bit there. Came out of fear a couple of minutes ago. I'll probably be back in fear again. Um, yeah, it, it's it's a uh, it's amazing what's happening around this. I'm I'm curious if you might tell us a little bit about your lunch, because you had lunch today, the two of you, and uh, and had a conversation. I'm sure it's the kind of thing that I'm like, I wish I could have mic'd them up before they had lunch, because that would be fun to hear what those two would talk about, as it relates to what's happening in this world. Um, and and how did you find out Dan's age again? How did you? Yeah. <laughs> I don't know. There's a respect question is all we're saying. Um, you know, since we just uh, met in person today and, and we have two different uh, companies and charters and missions. And the, and the irony, of course, is and everything both of us are doing need each other uh, in really, really cool ways. And, uh, you know, describing that um, that sales process and monitoring the sales process, really cool. What if you could have all the sales content and all the information that salespeople need in, in addition to the process, but the, all the presentations and, and price pages and, and competitive information and all that available also in, in that same application. So we, we've, uh, we what a hundred million dollar deal today i think is what it turned <laughs> it out be. to be that might be an understatement i'm but, serious but it, but he had to pay for lunch is all i'm saying so you know if you're if you're in hr or if you're in the in the c-suite or in in any business um executive teams you know that ai is going to change the future of work more than anything that's ever happened before it's just going to happen and it's going to happen so fast it's not like a decades long or centuries long industrial revolution it's happening very very quickly so johnny taylor who is the ceo of sherm the society for human resource management he's been giving a keynote for about a year and throwing out a formula ai plus HI, human intelligence, equals ROI. He's trying to invite all HR professionals and business leaders around the world to figure out the proper way to bring AI into the workplace so that it augments human intelligence because the human element is the most important by far, but AI as a tool can be used to make leaders better leaders and managers better managers, salespeople better salespeople. Anytime there's a role model or a success model in any department in any company, AI could dissect what makes that person a top performer and other people not as good of a performer. And an AI model could be crafted, which could then help nudge and grow and help other people to apply the same techniques and achieve the same successful outcomes. And so our, our company, soar.com, has partnered with Sherm, and Sherm's going to be rolling out an AI platform in the coming months that will allow every meeting, every call to be recorded and transcribed, and then leadership training, uh, management training, empathy, appreciation, all the things that make a good culture for a workplace can be analyzed and in a gentle way, nudge leaders and managers to show up better and to elevate the workplace experience for every employee in every workplace around the world. That's Sherm's mission, elevate the workplace experience. AI is just a tool. But as Dan said, every single enterprise that starts to record and analyze meetings, and of course you have note taking, you have tasks, you have business process management outcomes, but every single one of those knowledge workers needs access to every document that that company has produced. So there really could be an interesting partnership. Uh, we'll see, we'll see how it unfolds, but I'm very excited about what he's doing and he's been pioneering this for many, many years. And uh, yeah, it's it's a very exciting time. Yeah, okay, so you, you just, I just, again, from fear to excitement, all in that one answer, damn it. Um, okay, so when I first met Lucy through Dan, uh, there was a comment about the questions you asked Lucy, Lucy can actually analyze you. And so essentially Lucy is judging us based on the questions we ask her, um, which is still lingering in my head. And I met Lucy, whatever it was, five years ago, six years ago. Now I'm like, wait a minute, wait a minute. You're going to record all the communications and, oh man, that, that little bit of fear there, a little bit of fear. What does that mean? How do we manage the, the machine, right? And what, and what sort of response do you think general population employees will have to that? Well, you know, it's an interesting question. What uh, Are we afraid of people evaluating our work in a realistic and reasonable way? Or are we afraid that we're not good enough? So 
The we're not good enough component is A, we need to know that, but the process is how do we make you better, right? And you talked about, we, we both use the word AI, not as artificial intelligence, but augmented intelligence. And it's really an important thought process. Lucy has always been, and we're eight years in the market, about making the knowledge worker better at what they're doing, giving them access to the right information to make the best decision now in a timely fashion. Decisions can't, can no longer wait three months for the research study, right? We move, the, the, the speed of business is now. And so we all have to uh, um, embrace and adopt what is scary, leverage these tools to make ourselves better and our organizations better, and there will be fallout. You're here because you don't want to be part of fallout. You're here because you want to enable your organizations. So I wouldn't worry because you're here. When you talk to people and say, have you used chat GPT? And they say, no, they should be afraid. Because, and, and actually John Stav is here at University of Minnesota. The whole concept of, um, I, got a, I got an email from my son today and, he, and it was a scan from a book pages and he said, dad, can you OCR this? So I quickly OCR'd it and sent it back to him. What's he gonna do with it? He's at the U. He's gonna feed it into chat GPT to work with it. Is that good or bad? Got news for you. If you think it's bad, you're wrong. We need our students to come out ready. We don't need the old world to be imposed upon them because that's not what anybody is going to pay him to do next year. You need our students to understand how to do this. We need to understand how to do this. And we need to be able to leverage the technology to do what's right. He's gonna interact with the data and create an output that is his. Remember when the internet came, everyone's like, oh, libraries better. You need to know how to use the world book. When's the last time anybody went to use a world book? Encyclopedia Britannica, right? That, those are historical things. And, and, and they're beautiful, right? And they're, but we used to come home from dinner to get the answer. Now we just answer at the tables. The speed of business is changing. And we all need to understand how to use these technologies, leverage these technologies to make us better, to make our products better, make our companies better, make the world better. I love Dan's answer. I'm glad, so do I. I'm glad you went in that direction. But, I, but I'm also super sensitive to psychological safety in the workplace and kind of some traditional corporate practices that I despise, like stack ranking employees through some quantitative analysis and dropping the five or 10% lowest performers every year. I think that's dehumanizing. I think it should be thrown out a long time ago. Um, I think every individual has unique talents and gifts. And if a hiring manager or workplace leaders are intelligent and caring, they will try to find the best opportunity for that person in that in that corporation. Now, there's not maybe not always a perfect fit, but uh, psychological safety matters. We're trying to design the platform so that it's really easy for individuals to get feedback on how they can improve. And then there's some kind of roll-up report so that managers and leaders can see that they're trying to improve. Um, but we want to do it incognito mode, maybe for three months when you're trained on sales or leadership. And you're not good at it at first because you just went through the training. So maybe you get three months of incognito mode where you get feedback, but your leaders and managers don't get to see any of the feedback. Like we're conscious that there needs to be psychological safety designed into it. Also, humans are fragile. We're, we're, we actually need validation. And my love language is words of affirmation. So I want my AI to give me five positive things about me for every one you know, constructive criticism. So we're actually going to design, a, you know, marriage science and workplace science all says a five to one ratio of positive to negative is important. And so maybe that will be adjustable or whatever, but we don't want to build a tool that we already have a government that surveils its citizens. We already have corporations and trillion dollar companies that surveil us and target our time, our time and attention with uh, ad, selling ads to the highest bidder 
and billions and billions of hours a day are spent glued to screens that we can't put down because the algorithms and the AI is so intelligent about us. I love that answer. And by the way, God, I love that nice answer too. Yours. Do you like that? I love that answer. That's a great answer. Oh my. It was marvelous. Beautiful. Well, thank you. <laughs> but, but I'm going to MIT to do a paper tomorrow. There's a, there's a global or a movement called Project Liberty funded by the former owner of the Dodgers, Frank McCord. He's putting $500 million towards creating a new protocol for the internet called the decentralized social media protocol. And if enough companies and app developers embrace it and billions of people sign on to the DSMP, it will take the power away from the trillion dollar companies who currently hoard up all the data they can about every one of us so they can target our time and attention better. And it will put the digital identity control in our laps and it will allow us to control what data is had about us for everything we sign into. So I'm hopeful that something like Project Liberty, the DSMP, could turn the tide away from corporate surveillance and corporate, you know, data hoarding and Anyway, it's we live in a scary time already. Yeah, AI might actually shift the power back to us if we if we, if do we it all right. use it. Right. Yeah. If it's used in good ways and good intentions, we can, yeah, vet out the assholes essentially, right, out of the organizations or whatnot, <laughs> get them out. Hopefully, uh, I love that. You you have another question. No. Well, the more conversations that are had that talk about this connection between that AI still needs the human element that will help take some of this fear away. And I think that's one of the reasons why we loved our pre call with you because you went into it scared and you came out of it excited. I know the roller coaster that you go on because I get a random text from you every once in a while. Um, so let's talk a little bit more about maybe some of those applications and where are the other opportunities for the, those two to come together because we want people to leave here excited about it and not fearful of it and excited to support it my friend lizzie uh we talked for a while she talked about the the kind of younger people uh i forget the labels um gen z or whatever but the ni the nihilism like the fear of the future and and you know it's been a couple of decades since gallup polls showed that parents don't think their children will be economically better off than they were and 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 there's lots of reasons why young people are afraid well think of this um how many of us feel like we're in control of our government at the federal level and do we all love the 34 trillion dollars of debt like do we all love the endless wars like the government is not of the people by the people and for the people anymore it just isn't and at the local level most of us probably have no clue what's going on at the school board or at the city council because we have jobs and lives and we're supposed to elect representatives to represent us the people so one of our projects is citizenportal.ai it's transcribing every government meeting in the united states that we can find a video of and then creating a powerful full text search engine and then a retrieval augmented generation kind of a gpt and then it will start sending alerts to citizens before the topic is discussed in the upcoming meeting so that we can actually pay attention in just minutes a week you could find out at the local state and federal level every issue you care about with an ai generated feed so imagine if millions or tens of millions of citizens actually wake up and become informed and engaged and hold our representatives accountable and stop letting them run the show and run the the, the, the everything's going off the rails right now i am back to excited again thank you very much <laughs> um i know i yes It's, so when you get your alert, you can say, I'm alerted to something that's based on truth. The truth standard for the citizen portal is, did it happen in a government meeting that was a public meeting that was recorded? Did the mayor and the city council members actually say these things? So we're not saying that what they say is true. We're saying it's the official record of what happened in the government. It's like the congressional. Exactly. Well, right, right. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I mean, but. Actually, I, uh, augmented intelligence, artificial intelligence, it is up, dis, up to us to be able to discern what this content is and where it makes sense. 
And the fact that people believe the stuff that is out there is mind blowing to those who actually think about stuff. And it's not right or it's everywhere, right? So just be, I'm not picking a side here. I'm literally saying the stuff people believe is mind blowing, right? And we are trying to just say, hey, we're trying to present to knowledgeable people, good content. Um, and, and part of the flaws in the LLMs are they have a lot of everything in them. Part of the flaws in the LLM is it's public domain that can have everything in them. Part of the flaws from a corporate perspective in the LLMs is there's no layers of security. Because how many of you work for companies? In your companies, does the CEO have the same access to information as the, as the lowest line worker? Almost never. And LLMs, if you think is gonna solve your problem in your company, wait a minute, does that mean everybody gets to know everything? Because that's never gonna be the case. So we have to present information. People have to be able to discern information. Uh, interesting, there's another organization which you should check out, which is called represent.us or US. And it's again, bipartisan and they, they did a study. And this is a great little factoid that you're just gonna get scared again. Um, if, if a bill in, in Congress has zero support from the populace, it's 30% likely to succeed. What the if hell? a bill has a hundred percent support in the populace, it's 30% likely to succeed. So if you think the system's broken, you might be right. <laughs> For the people. Another data fact that could be augmented or allow humans to actually process what's going on. There's a company, I think it's a for-profit even, called Open the Books. They have set up a machine to do like 55,000 FOIA requests per year of every city, county, state, and federal agency. And they get checkbook data down to the vendor level. They're not getting the budget that was passed by the Congress or the legislature. They're getting the, then it's fact. Exactly. So we're trying, we're, we're hoping to partner with them. And then when you get the city council or the state legislature talking about spending or budget or whatever, you could say, well, this contractor just made $12 million last year. And they happen to be friends with the campaign manager who brought this senator into office or whatever. I, I'm from Missouri right now. I live in Missouri. Um, you know, New York City had Tammany Hall corruption for the 1850s and 60s. Uh, Missouri had a lot of corruption in the 1890s. And there was a guy named Joel Folk who became the governor, but he was like the top anti-corruption politician in the United States for like 10 or 20 years. So imagine if citizens can get AI that tells us something is stinks in Denmark, uh, and let's go figure out how to stamp that out, okay? That's one positive outcome if citizens are armed with this data. It's not enough though. We should be proud of the country we live in, the freedoms we have, and all the good things that have happened over the past few centuries, the progress that's been made, et cetera. So one of the goals of Citizen Portal is to help everyone find, has anyone solved homelessness? Has any community figured out how to deal with mental health issues or had a higher graduation rate or reduced recidivism through some intervention? Uh, what, what communities have healthy, happy uh, lives and et cetera? And then find out what was the root cause of that success? What turned something into from a problem to a res resolved problem? And if imagine if citizens can find out there are ways to create healthier, happier citizens, higher graduation rates, better uh, entrepreneurship. And let's just, as citizens find out, well, this town, this city, this county did it. Now let's bring that model to our representatives and say, we should do that here. That's happened in entrepreneurship. There are dozens of places around the country where there are unbelievable venture capital, angel investor, and entrepreneur ecosystems. Boulder, Colorado, Brad Feld. Like, He's written five or six books on it, but like thousands, tens of thousands of jobs, incredible growth. Government, did they have a role? Maybe a little, but a citizen or a volunteer or whatever. I just think there's a chance to stamp out corruption faster with the help of AI and also shine a light on the things that are wonderful and working and try to spread them throughout the laboratories of democracy. And I think there's some really great potential there. Yeah. The feeding the machine is really fascinating. The amount of 
data it's consuming, the amount of knowledge it's consuming. I do have I have those moments of thinking about what in just local governments, um, areas where you're like, how effective is it? I mean, how if you have a certain tax rate, how effective do they use that tax as a government? Probably no one's really looking. No, I mean, how do you even get to the that? ones that are voting right. for it or spending it? They're probably not what? analyzing it compared to other. You know, I just think there's very little thoughtfulness uh, about does the money work? Does the program work? No, we just keep going with yeah. what we were doing. Like and our ability to process all that is it's way beyond us and we're giving this machine the ability. So I'm back to excitement, but <laughs> I'm gonna ask a question that I know I'm gonna fear because you've already talked about it. And uh, on the pre-call, we did a little like, hey, well, you know, what's going on? This stuff is freaking me out. And you said, yeah, people will worship this thing. <laughs> oh my God. I should, we uh, talked about we that movie, The Gods Must Be Crazy, right? <laughs> Can you imagine a GPT a, a voice activated device that shows up somewhere in a culture where they don't have technology and it knows everything. It's a super intelligence. It's a collective intelligence of everything that humans have ever written or said. Uh, yeah, no, I think, I think um, it's possible that humans will have some primeval instinct to try to think this is a deity of some kind. Right. This is also why I don't want to anger the deity um, just in case it does get there. <laughs> right uh I, whatever i say about it, it's positive it's good yeah it'll be fine it's right. all yeah this is all being oh, yeah. fed into the big i know GPT i know, in the I, know. Sky. I know it uploads after the show <laughs> and it'll know the fact that you were afraid and afraid and expressed it is it's too late art <laughs> thank you thank you that's great that's just lovely uh we can we can open up the questions to the audience because that's going to naturally happen, I think, here. Kitty, do you? Oh, dear. He's going. <clears throat> you know, there's a, there's a whole constitution issue. Uh, the question is, is are we truly going to have a direct democracy? Uh, really intriguing. You know, one of the reasons everyone says you can't is because people don't have the knowledge or the access to the knowledge to be able to do that. What Paul just described takes you a long way towards that, right? But in the end, we're talking about a constitutional change here in the United States. So it, it, it's, it's, uh, it, it's a long time to do that and actually represent that uh, US or us. I mean, part of what they're doing is saying we got to start at the local level and maybe we can become Anybody, who knows the mayor of Wyzetta or the future mayor of Wyzetta? Because he's sitting here. Um, and uh, uh, But he's actually jumping on because he cares. But the bottom line is we need, um, we need to start by, it, it's got to start locally, right? We can't start nationally. It doesn't work that way. Things happen by, by local and then state, and, and then it becomes a, a national thing. And uh, the more we can actually influence outcomes, become part of the process. Um, I had I recently, uh, you know, uh, attended a, a school board meeting because I knew there was going to be an issue, and I wanted to weigh in. I, when I say that, I attended because my wife grabbed my ear and and <laughs> and told me I was going. Um, but it's important, right? And the point was, I, I did go. Uh, but the, it's important and, and we have to, part of it is we all have to get off the couch to do that and, and become a participant in the process because we all know we disagree with things that are happening. The other key though is leverage the technologies we're here talking about and others to have the right information because there's so much misinformation that is mind blowing in today's world. And, you know, we've got, um, obviously, we've got a couple wars going on, we have geopolitical issues, and we have absolute misunderstandings that are, the irony is just mind blowing. Um, you know, to see someone stand up with uh, an LGBTQ sign for Hamas. If anybody knows anything is they will kill you in two seconds. If you were in Gaza with that sign, you'd be dead. And yet you think it's okay to represent that. And it's just ignorance. It's not, I mean, there's no knowledge that if they knew they wouldn't do that. 
and 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 we have an opportunity to change or hopefully control Russia, and we're we're running away from it. We can do it with dollars, not our bodies and our people. And so people don't understand what's going on in this world, but we need to educate ourselves. We need to leverage these technologies. And we also can't allow ourselves to be influenced by the fake knowledge. Now, there are some technologies too coming out which are gonna help people determine this is real, right? And, and altered images being the first kind of thing and all the big image companies are working on this where Anybody touches an image, it'll be watermarked, and therefore the computer will be able to tell you that this has been watermarked as altered. Google, Microsoft, Adobe, Nikon, Sony, camera manufacturers are putting this C2PA uh, standard. I was there in Las Vegas at the NAB on Monday, and I sat through that panel. It's very encouraging that the industry is combining forces to make sure that we can detect uh, image uh, fakes, etc. Now, on the direct democracy question, I think Nashville did an experiment a couple years ago where they said five or ten million dollars of the city budget will be voted on directly by the citizens, and it went really well. The citizen direct vote on that budget deployment was really successful, so I think they doubled it the next year. So I think that could give everyone a taste. But if we're not paying attention, then our votes really won't be informed, and that's why we have representatives that are full time elected to try to you know, guide the country or our, or our states the way we're supposed to, but they're not being paid, there's, there's no attention being paid. Since the demise of the newspaper industry has stopped allowing local news, newspapers used to be very, very powerful in this country, and they would send journalists to cover pretty much every government meeting, and they were the ones that found corruption and uh, inefficiency. Well, that's gone. The industry doesn't even hardly have money in them anymore at all. It's all gone to the trillion dollar tech companies with ad spend. So citizen journalists or citizen, uh, we, just, we just have to do a lot more because that void exists and the lack of trust between citizens and governments is at an all time high. And we can bridge that together, I think. Um, the, yeah, the, the, we have the worst form of government amongst a whole bunch of really bad forms of government, but the best of that, right? What was, there's a line around that, right? Which is kind of like, oh, would AI impact that in a positive way, perhaps, but it's gonna pretty quickly identify the fact that this is a very bad form of government, um, but yet you leave it up to the average. Have you met the average citizen? I mean, just literally the average citizen. It's kind of scary, right? It's not like, oh, I mean, you're that informed? Um, I would hope that there's a, an ability to become more informed, to be a, a voting citizen if you're doing a direct democracy, right? Because it also, movements happen so quickly here, right? Things spread like that. And all of a sudden, like, we got to vote on this. Well, maybe not. Maybe we settle it down. There's a lot of friction in the system we've got right now. It's slow as hell, but it's kind of good that it's slow sometimes. Direct democracy is really mob rule by the majority. It's, it's right. too scary. I, I, I don't think it will really work. And we have constitution that was designed to have slow checks and balances, distribution of powers, limited enumerated powers at every level of government. It's designed to be slow and painstaking and, you know, not to be a top down, you know, Premier Xi, uh, Xi in China can make a decision and the whole Communist Party apparatus and all the corporations have to comply. Yeah. And that's very fast. They can do something. They could build a, you know, two million population city in, in a year or two. And that's just not how democracy and participatory government was designed to work. And it's a good example of like the one child, the one child, right? He's regretting that one. They're regretting that for sure. Yes. Our I'm going to get us off of politics. Uh, so thanks for outing me, Dan. Um, I, I wanted to turn the conversation to IP. It's trademark uh, who owns the actual data that's training AI because uh, foundation of our constitution is trademark. Um, foundation of, of business and, and at least in the Western world is based on some sort of protection around who owns what IP. So how, how is that gonna get sorted out? Litigation's already started extensively and it goes way beyond image. It goes way, way deeper than that. And how is that gonna get sorted out in terms of who gets to monetize? Cause the AI companies should not be the only ones monetizing someone else's work. Thank you. Right. So this is, I, I mean, unbelievable. The way LLMs were built, right, is absorbing all information everywhere. And, and I mean, the biggest issue they're having is for version five, there's not enough information to continue to absorb. 
So your IP, everyone's IP is in these models. So I uh, scared you. Um, <laughs> yeah, your book is in these models. Um, uh, so what does that mean? And how do, and what's the outcome going to be? Because we're, what, first answer is it's 20 years of litigation. So what's really likely to happen is something similar to how music is paid for, or there's a copyright clearing center already where already there are microtransactions paying people for intellectual property. And so we have to come up with a thoughtful way that allows people to be compensated for what's there. Uh, and, and actually big newspapers are already being paid, right? There's, there are transactions already happening. There's a, a economy happening. And I think the New York Times isn't doing it because they want to do it themselves, right? The, so, uh, but, but things are going to settle before the 20 years of lawsuits uh, and, and countersuits and, and appeals and all that. And we're going to have to have a process um to to do that I, I am we're not working on that uh in there but there are people that are and uh and in the end um i think there's a scarier question because if ai does everything and we don't have jobs how do we make money and and i'm more scared of that than i am of my intellectual property being reused in a micro form um th that that does that. So they're scary here. There's outcomes that we need to f account for in the future. And what does that look like in, in lots of ways? One of which is IP, um, one of which is being able to tell where it came from. Um, source attribution is, a, is an additive feature that didn't exist that now exists in these GPT models which allows you to kind of start to get to, we can compensate people because there can be a ticker in the background. There's one other comment. I go to the American Library Association annual conference every year. And last year was interesting because the, Ameri the Library of Congress put out a policy paper where they are taking the position that any content generated by generative AI is not copyrightable. Okay, so if you think about Wikipedia, what a gift Wikipedia has been to the world, it's not Britannica, which was copyrighted. It is a kind of open source, creative commons. Everybody can use it, no copyright. A huge boon to all of humanity to have Wikipedia. It's like a top five website in almost every language. Well, imagine if that, if that Library of Congress policy holds where every question that billions of people ask generative AI, go create this music or this art or this uh, essay or poem. If every single thing is not copyrightable, the creative commons explodes into abundant usefulness for all humanity. I'm actually kind of excited about that. Whereas I think people that create their own works uh, and make a living as a writer or a producer or whatever, they deserve to be compensated. And I don't like what open AI has done with just sucking up everything with no permission and and then skirting around the issue, not not answering, you know, where did you, where's your training data from? Uh, I don't know. Like they're just saying, I don't know. But but I but I do like this generative AI potentially not copyrightable. That's kind of an interesting scenario. Yeah, you were the coolest nerd ever. You went to a library conference. That's what I got out of <laughs> I that whole a thing. Master's degree in library science. It's more <laughs> than a book. My wife you know. laughs at me every time she thinks she's like, go go to the library, Paul. Go to the library, Paul. A lot. So this is back on the topic of government. Uh, I love the idea of Citizen Portal, but are you afraid of how AI might be misused by the government? You know, maybe for further control or propaganda, that kind of thing? I am horrified by, is it FISA or FISA um, expanding its already horrible surveillance powers? Like I'm not, a, I, I was a Russian major in college. I interviewed with the National Security Agency, didn't take a job there, I ended up in tech. And what Edward Snowden did to kind of blow the whistle on the fact that, you know, billions and billions, like unlimited amounts of information about us without warrant being required. And now the, the Congress may be extending that and making it even deeper. I'm very scared about that. I don't like the China social credit score and I don't want to be um, in fear of everything I say or do is gonna be held against me. Like. I feel like the Fourth Amendment is super sacred and so is the First Amendment. And I think as citizens, we actually have to do something more than what we're doing to make sure that our government does not treat us as like suspicious people that they can go build files on 
without a warrant. Black Mirror should be fictional. It's starting to become, you know, nonfiction. It's a little scary. Have you seen the Blade Runners throughout London? Okay, that's pretty crazy. Like this seems like science fiction. Right. My son lives in London right now. And I was sending him messages every time I heard about the Blade Runners like knocking down another CCTV and they don't want to be surveilled so that certain kinds of cars can't drive into the city without a certain kind of tax. Like that's just one small group of organized people that are violently reacting against what the government of London is doing. Well, I'm afraid we're going down a really slippery slope right now in this country. China, uh, Canada's way further down this road than we are. Um, Damn, dude. Well, I mean, really, seriously. In Minneapolis, if you're downtown and don't think that you're on camera and being audio recorded, you're mistaken. So now the other side of that is don't commit crimes, but um, but how people use this content and and uh, and the places and how uh, again the power to reach in it and and do bad, you know. But again, it's it's how we deploy what we're doing. Unfortunately, it's, there's things we can control and there's things we can't control. Um, I I can vote to change things, and I. And, and uh, my number one question, because we know that more than half the people don't vote, so don't complain if you don't vote. If you vote, you have a right to complain, otherwise shut up. I get, because I get sick of it. I ask people that, well, I, I didn't. Really? I don't want, then your opinion no longer matters because we have to exercise the right to, to change whatever it is that we think and need to change. And, uh, and again, it, it's a, uh, if, if I could vote for a law, it would be ever, it's a required voting. Right. Why don't we require it? Because we need everybody's input in the process, and we need to understand that it has a it has an effect on the outcome. Um, uh, yeah, technology is scary, but every technology is scary. Uh, nuclear bombs are scary, but nuclear energy is actually quite good, right? And so, and 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 actually, we've gotten afraid of nuclear energy, and and we're probably wrong. I don't know enough to make all the assessment there, but I think it's still the right answer and we can now do it safer than we could in the past. And yet we're still not doing it and we're doing other stupid things and we continue to burn coal and harm other in other ways. And, and again, we need energy and, and all kinds of, stuff. we got to just let people know what we think. Are we, are we going for another question? Yeah, I've mean got a question for you guys from the back here about fluency and productivity. So uh, Wharton prof Ethan Mollick has got that book out, Co-Intelligence, great book. He talks about AI as a, quote, prosthesis for thinking, right? So it's, it's about enabling and empowering. How do you help people get over that, get into the habit of using the tools? You know, so he talks about you should put 10 hours in. My guess is most people in the room haven't put 10 hours in. How do you encourage people to use the tools daily at their desks in all of their tasks? I just spent half an hour with Lizzie and that's all we talked about was like, use it 10, 20 times a day. Use ChatGPT, the paid version with the voice interface in your car when you're driving. It's constant. You just have to be asking it. And here's what I think will be exciting. When your meetings are recorded, but each of you have not just an AI note taker coming to the meeting, but an AI assistant or several AI agents that are trained to do the work that you're going to do after the meeting. And you finish the meeting and it's like, okay, you've got seven tasks and four of them, your AI volunteers to write that first draft, to create that 30 second video clip, to go back and put this research together and, and to send something to this, you know, prospective customer. And all of a sudden, what you said in the meeting, those thoughts which turned into words turned into reality. And guess what? As soon as people experience that and know that that's even possible, they will be all over it every day for the rest of their life. The generative AI capabilities to augment what we think about and what, we, what words we say will be turning words into reality in no time. Coders are experiencing this right now. You can have GPT-4 code all kinds of applications in Microsoft Copilot, like amazing software being built by just telling it what to write. It's insane. And all of us are gonna have those kind of agents and bots in whatever role we're working in. And our productivity could go up two times, five times, 10 times, and we'll never wanna turn back the clock. Ooh, 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 I have an answer. 
gamification. There's a, let's, let's take this back to our businesses. When we roll out Lucy in a business, we create a scavenger hunt. We roll out and we create incentives to find information, to leverage the tool. It's, it's, a, it's a process. And actually, I'm gonna, how many of you are actually marketers here? Because it seems like a relevant audience. And how many of you, when launching a product, hire an agency? Okay, roll it out. There's a process, you do things. But when you roll out technology, you just, here it is. Okay, who's wrong? <laughs> we have to incent people to do the behaviors we want them to do. It's a, it's a funnel of the same process. Here's the new technology. I want you to be a daily user. And we have to take them through the process to get there. And so technology is the same as a new product or a new service being launched into the company. So yeah, we, we run awards and competitions and gamification and, and, uh, and whatever it takes. We have advertising, we have in, in, the, in the store, in the office advertising about using the tool and trying stuff out. But just here it is, is not the answer unless it's a have to use it. Like, Here's the new purchase order system, because if you want a purchase order, you have to use it. This isn't that. So you don't have to use it. You're supposed to use it. We want you to use it. We want to leverage AI. We want to leverage the knowledge that we have. We don't want to repay for the creation of data into knowledge. We don't want to repay for outside resources to do a research study that somebody else already did. Those are the, you know, that's the corporate incentive money, but the individual incentive is, hey, did you do that? How have you done th this process before you're allowed to do a different process? We have another question from the audience. Hey guys, uh, my name is John Marino. And so I kind of have a long winded question for Paul and Dan. So I'm old, I've seen a lot of change in my life. And there's been three shifts in my lifetime. First one, I would say, and I'm rounding, of course, is the internet. In 1996, that's what I call it. I know it happened before with email and everything else. But there was a shift, just like you guys noted, where people resisted the internet and they were like, no, this is a fad. And then by 2000, everybody had to have a website and then it was rock and roll for the internet. The second shift, what I'm gonna say is 2010 was social media. And even though it happened before and there was many iterations, that was the big shift where businesses were like, no, this is a fad, it's a waste of time. And then everybody was like, oh my God, we have to have a Facebook page. We have to be on social media. The third shift in our lifetime is AI right now. And this conversation, in my opinion, feels like the year 2000, where we're discussing AI and we're talking about these possibilities and we're talking about these different things. But my question to you, Dan and Paul is, I feel like AI is going into, every one of us in the room will have our own bot because AI technology already exists where we can have our own voice recorded. We can have it respond to texts, to emails, to all communications. So Dan, if I'm talking to you, you could literally train a bot to not only do, let's say the preferences, Paul, what you're talking about in government, I could have my bot just go, yeah, contact these people, do it on your own time, make it all sound natural, my voice is recorded, it does all the work for me, and it just takes that up. And, and the same with you, Paul, is like, where do you see where your bot is doing all the automation for everything you want done? Because as the LLMs build up the knowledge, the technology is just gonna make the bot stronger, so all of us will sound and appear smarter. You have a question? That is the question. How, how long do you think it will be until each one of us 
has a bot I that represents us. Give us a year. I already have one. That has your voice that it, responds it, to your texts and emails? It, it, it doesn't have my actual voice. It has my voice in communication. I mean, you, this is, you just didn't describe the future. You described the now. It's a hundred percent available what you just described. Right now. I mean, not to the, to every interaction and all kinds of things. That's right. And, and I just actually want to take you just a different place in the big transitions that you should be thinking about. The earliest United States of America, the workers were on the farms. We, we farm behind ox and horse. We transitioned to machinery, the farmers, all the people went to the cities, they worked in manufacturing and we had jobs in manufacturing. We then changed manufacturing and automated it or sent it offshore and we became knowledge workers. The transition that's happening today is what's going to happen to knowledge workers. Now you got me back to fear again, dude. What the hell? That's not good. I mean, like, where do they, what do, it's, uh, it's the art just, of the possible. just to be clear, prompt engineer is not a job. That's like sanitation engineer. Let's stop with that stuff. There's no such thing. No, but the, the ability to write a prompt in the current state is really, really important. And to write a good prompt and to understand, you know, how many of you have uploaded your American Express bill and your expense Excel sheet and asked, chat GPT to fill it out, because I have. Just think about what I just said. Like, that's a task. I don't want to do that. I can just upload the bill and upload the template and say, put all these items in there. I'm good with it taking away all the monotony. That's good. All the monotony. What I suppose to be that's the stuff that we're not even realizing we're doing every day, like that. I don't want to interact with people's bots or agents. I really don't. I, and I don't want people to have to interact with mine. I don't mind having an AI assistant that doesn't look or sound like me. I have a friend who tricked a bunch of people for five minutes because he had a voice avatar. He had a replica of himself. He held a meeting. Have you heard about the scam that was like $25 million two weeks ago where someone was on a phone call said, hey, let's jump on a Zoom to verify this $25 million. And the Zoom CEO and CFO were deep fakes. And this person fell for a $25 million wire transfer. Yeah, it's maybe the biggest deep fake scam that I've heard of. But so I'm not a fan of that. I love humans and I want to be uh, an approachable human. So I think there are ways to accomplish the automation and get rid of the banality without pretending that it's me or without making it have to look like a high fidelity version of me. That's just my personal philosophy. Um, but I could see within six months to a year, dozens of AI bots and um, agents that I can deploy under my direction to do all the tasks. I, we have some advisors from Seattle right now that are interviewing our different employees and automating the work, work uh, all the workflows that they do on a day-to-day -day basis. He's saving, Barry, my friend, is saving hours and hours every day doing the kind of things you did, but he, he's building them so that they can be done over and over again. So I think it won't be, I mean, when GPT-5 comes out, in all likelihood, it'll be 10 to 100 times better than GPT-4, and it will blow all of our minds way beyond what the current state of the art is. I, I'm very optimistic that we're going to be able to be in control of our time and aim at goals and values that we have in a way that will free us from a lot of the mundane grind that we've all been living through in the 21st and 20th century. Dan's not going to let me move on to another question. Are you? I just want to say I, I, I do want a bot to do lots of my answering of questions, not because it's imitating me, but because it's doing my, it, it's representing me to hundreds of people that I wouldn't have time to represent myself to, which is different than, I'm not trying to fake them. I just want my opinion in the room. I want my concepts shared inside a broader version of my company. And, and I don't have time to be in every meeting. That's different than faking who I am. Yeah. I don't want to fake who I am. I want you to know that this is been, has an understanding of me. And if you question it, question me. I, That's I look cool. forward to a virtual Dan conversation real with life a virtual Dan. Is too busy. So he's sending his well, agent. I, right. I want to actually be on an island in Lake of the Woods. <laughs> okay. We have one more question I want to get to to my favorite professor at St. Thomas specifically. <laughs> 
that she's been waiting a long time to ask her question. Thank you. So Lisa Abendroth, St. Thomas. Dan, I'm going to start with you. You came and talked to our faculty at the Opus College back in, I think, about 18, about Lucy. And you said something that surprised me. You said, it's almost, I, I want to get to the issue of kind of trust versus skepticism of the outcome. And you said in, our, in an early version, we come up with this, we've looked at all your marketing reports, here's what you recommend. You said it was too much for people, and you actually had to pull back a little bit to help them because they didn't trust, they didn't trust the results because it was like, I wasn't in the loop. How do I trust this? You had to pull back. What I'm hearing a lot now is this kind of balance between trust and skepticism. You want people to trust that it's doing its job, but you want it to be skeptical if there's, you know, something that's been robot generated. Um, and you talked about what we teach people. How do you approach the idea of getting people to be users of AI to be both trustful and skeptical? How do you approach that? Well, and again, I I want to take it back to what we do in our companies, right? Because the, the broader world is, is a harder place to do this, but there's a process in companies to bring in technology and AI. And, um, and you know, we're at some really large companies and, and actually um, uh, ChatGPT came out. And the first thing that's happened in companies is we need an AI policy. Well, and then you read the AI policy and it's a chat GPT policy. And the fact that they have an AI in the company for 20 years, not relevant. And so they, but we got to get to the right words and all kinds of things. Um, and I ended up in, you know, a fortune 100 company in front of the CTO, the head of legal and the CIO and defending what Lucy does and how we do it. And to this day, we're still the only authorized solution in this company. And the reason is because if you're doing it correctly, you can defend how you're doing it. Um, I, just before our lunch, the infamous lunch today, uh, a prospect, which is a huge uh, medical company said, two questions, can we use our own LLM? And Lucy's bring your own, we don't care, happy to do that, yes. And then the second one was, and can you in effect defend how you do it because we don't want just a black box? And the answer is yes. Right? And so those things are important inside companies. And then when the company rolls out a tool, part of that trust has to be built because you went through their security process, their AI process, you know, the, the important things. And that is just part of onboarding a technology in a company. And a matter of fact, uh, I'm shocked when somebody doesn't do it or even has what I would consider a deficient process because I've gone through the process a hundred times. Right, I know what it should be like, and it's not fun. It's you know, it's a proctology exam to Lucy, right? And I have, and and, and we have processes, and we're ISO certified, and all kinds of proof of what we're doing, and that we're doing it as industry standard, and that we pr follow our practices, um, and that's certified, and usually once a year to each of our, you know, process wise, building trust. So if it, if it's rolled out in your company. You have to, you know, there's some assumption of what that looks like. We do share it. Uh, uh, there's on, you know, documentation of what it is, um, all of all of the things. And then, you know, we, we have to deliver the answers and the answers that we deliver are always from your content, right? So it's from the data inside a company. So, and it's not that it's without a bias. The bias is your existing bias, not the internet bias. You know, I mean, there's so uh, perfect. It is not, but it's representative of who the company is, and and again, these companies have process. Uh, you know, we're working for government contractors. I mean, we got process. We're we're working security organizations. It's somewhat a joke. It sometimes I, I laugh because security organizations and big companies are hundreds of people, and they and there's ten in each section of it. And of course, and Lucy, it's me, you know, I'm responsible. I'm the CEO and chief security officer because that's the number one thing that matters to us, right? If we don't have a secure environment, we're dead. If we're not doing it in an appropriate way, we're dead, right? Somebody wanted to fix something once and it was to remove security. I said, stop, that's not gonna happen. Right? Nice. In addition to the nihilism that Lizzie and I talked about that was, really troubling 
a trend that troubles me probably more than I could ever express is the lack of reading of the great books. Um, and if people, I was a humanities major, when deep fakes started coming out, I told hundreds of humanities students, read all the best books and read the books written by current leaders and read nonfiction and filled your brain with the best produced written and edited content that exists in the world because the garbage that can be thrown on the internet and spread to billions of people in a matter of milliseconds is so much noise that until we can actually as humans process real signal the classics the great thoughts the great thought leaders and the truth that you can find in linear reading uh, Tim, Tim Sanders once wrote a book called Love is the Killer App, and he said 80% of your information should come from books because they go through a much better process in being writing, written and, and edited and, and published and versus a blog or an article or breaking news on CNN. So my biggest fear um, is that humans are being dumbed down. If you saw the cult film, was it Idiocracy? Or yeah. like, like, oh my gosh, what if we never read and we look at our screens and virtual reality and we get dumber and dumber and dumber? Like, okay, that doesn't bode well. Sorry. Yeah, uh, there I am again, <laughs> right there. No, I, it's, yeah, I love that books. Yes, absolutely. The Stoics, books. Plato, anybody. Right. <laughs> Self-published books. You got it. When what he what? just said is a hundred percent true, but from a publisher. Real publisher. Real publisher. <laughs> because I can publish a book in an hour today. On it's available on Amazon is not a book definition. From a publisher. Good call. Yes, thank you for that. Thank you for that. Another good reason to actually have a publisher if you're going to publish a book, write a book, important thing. Though, we have gone way the frack over. Um, I think it's probably possibly because of the subject matter and the interest in this. And uh, we literally had three questions ourselves and didn't need them. Um, and we figured this was going to happen. Didn't even give them the questions because they didn't need them. Um, this has been fantastic, absolutely amazing. Um, we have another great pairing coming up next month. Um, we also have uh, the founder of Blue Zones at some point in time, Dan Butner, who's got a nice Netflix special. He's a client and a friend. He'll be on the stage. And uh, we have a really interesting announcement. We're going to do one of these at the airport. We're going to do behind the scenes at the airport, behind security. Um, one of the Thinking Link events, we got invited to do this at the airport, which is going to be best described as, well, that's fucking weird. <laughs> yes, yes. And we like that uh, because the robots can't do fucking weird yet. That's my belief, at least. I don't know. Yeah, there we go. Anyway, thank you, everyone. And thank you, Dan and Paul. This was absolutely amazing. Absolutely amazing. <laughs>